The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, It is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that you teach us how to be a servant, how to love one another. And we ask us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week we have the parable of the talents, or perhaps it's better translated as the parable of the bags of gold. And the meaning of this parable is a little bit different than the parables we've heard before, like perhaps the parable of the lost sheep, which we can understand as Jesus finds the sheep and brings them back. And we can clearly understand that one. But I think this one's a little harder to understand. So let's start first with the traditional reading, which sees the master or Jesus as or excuse me, which sees the master as God or Jesus. And the servants are followers of Jesus. And the talents are our gifts or our abilities, or maybe even our financial resources. And we're called to use these talents for the glory of God and not bury them like the third servant. And we each get different gifts and God has different expectations for all of us. In this parable, Jesus is calling us to be productive. We are to demonstrate to Jesus how we've used these gifts for the benefit of the kingdom, because much will be expected of those to whom much has been given. And our reward for our hard work will be that we'll enter into the happiness of the master like the first and second servants. So what are we to make of this traditional interpretation? It's a good message, a good message of stewardship of our talents, but I think it's only part of the picture. And if we stop right there, we haven't really fully understand the full meaning and impact of this parable and what it would have meant to the people of that time that were hearing it then and why they needed to hear that parable 
and why we might want to hear it today through their eyes and ears. To begin with, where is this parable in the Gospel of Matthew in the story of Jesus? It's in the last week of his life, in the last few days, and he's been preparing to go to Jerusalem and telling his disciples that he's going to go there to die to complete the mission of the Father. And these parables are meant to be the final teachings before his death. Matthew offers in these parables a series of stories and images to describe what the kingdom of heaven is like. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And that's how the parable of the 10 bridesmaids and the talents begins. And this is a contrast from the earlier part of Matthew where we're learning who Jesus is, his identity. Jesus is someone who heals people, cures the leper, feeds 5,000 people, teaches from the mountainside like Moses. We also need to consider when the gospel of Matthew was written and who it was probably written for. Most Bible scholars think that Matthew was written about 50 years after Jesus, which means that it was after the destruction of the second temple, which happened in 70, which was when the Romans crushed the Jewish revolt and then tore down the temple. So Matthew was writing to a community of followers of Jesus who were on one side oppressed by the Romans, and on the other side, they were being oppressed by the Pharisees who were trying to bring them into legalism. This was a community that was waiting for the second coming of Jesus, the parousia, which is the time of judgment when Jesus would come back to make everything right, to completely fulfill the promise of the kingdom of heaven. There was probably a lot of anxiety in that community. Even the disciples thought that Jesus would return for the second time in their lifetime, but he didn't. So now when we look at these parables, and we hear about a bridegroom who is delayed, a master who has gone on a journey and has been away for a long time. It seems likely that these parables were written by Matthew for the benefit of the community of that time that was struggling with, how do we make sense of this delay? Jesus has not re yet returned to make things right, and we're struggling. How do these parables help them? Let's review the parables. In the parable of the talents, we're told the master is going away on a journey, and he calls his three servants together, and because he knows their abilities, he gives the first one ten, I mean, excuse me, five bags of gold, the second one two bags, and the third one one bag. And then after a long time, he comes back, and he finds that the first servant has doubled them to ten, and the second one to four. And he praises them for doubling the money, just like society praises us for doing well with our money. And then the third one says, well, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But instead of praising the, the servant for returning the talent, the master admonishes him, you wicked and lazy slave. So you knew about my character. And then why didn't you invest it for interest? I'm taking away the talent and giving it to the one that had 10, because those who have more will be given more, and those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as for you, you're going to get tossed out into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think sometimes we are too quick to say we understand a parable. And we take it at face value when we name each character in the parable and say, oh, well, the master, that's God. And the servants, the three servants, that's us. And we're supposed to be like the first two servants and not the third one. And we understand what the talents are. But we really can't decode the parables that easily. Jesus didn't mean for them to be that easily understood. He wanted us to, to wrestle with them and grapple with them from people's perspectives of the time as well as our perspective today. And in this parable, I'm inviting us to consider what if we don't view the master as God. After all, who wants an abuse of God like that master? But what if we think of the master as how the people of that time, when, Mo, when Matthew wrote the gospel, how they would have seen the master? They would have seen him as a Roman landowner, a rich person with lots of money. The master was a recognizable character. And they knew from experience how people got really wealthy during that time. 
by foreclosing on people's land. Because if you had an acre of land and you planted seed, and then what happened when the rain didn't come or locusts descended? Well, we know from John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath that when the rain didn't come and there was drought, the bankers came and they foreclosed on the land. And then the rich got richer and the poor were left with nothing. The master in this parable can be seen as the wealthy Roman landowner. And this is an indictment of the economic system of that time where the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. And most people lived hand to mouth, subsistence living. The first and the second servants go along with this system. So what about the third servant? The one that decided not to participate in the economic system. And instead of using his bag of gold to double its value for the master, he buried it in the ground, which was the safest thing to do because there weren't banks back then. There was no Chase Bank to run down to and get a certificate of deposit. He would have had to give it to money lenders and hope that they would give it back to him with interest. But he didn't participate in that system and we're really not told why. But sometimes we need to be in the position of the third servant not participating in a rigged system. What does this parable mean if we see it from that lens? Well, let's look at what happens next in the Gospel of Matthew. After this parable of talents, immediately we have the judgment of nations. And it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, with his angels with him, so it's the second coming of Jesus, he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. It's a fulfillment of the parousia. So these parables are preparing the community of that time, 50 years after Jesus, for the second coming of Jesus. Each story is told in the context of Jesus' second coming and has meaning to that community at that time. Matthew is reminding them that they're going to be judged for what happens in that waiting time and that Jesus is going to separate them into the sheep and goats, those who followed his commandment to love one another and those that didn't love but exploited the poor, gathering where they did not scatter seed. The ones that are going to inherit the kingdom are the ones that love their neighbor as themselves. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was a stranger when you welcomed me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then we discover that when we do that to the least of a person, we are doing it to Jesus. This is what Jesus is calling us to do. The greatest commandment, to love God and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're not being told to participate in an economic system that takes wealth from poor people and gives it to the rich so that they can become even richer. In fact, we have the parable of the rich young man who goes to Jesus and says, teacher, I have followed all the commandments. How do I get into the kingdom of, of heaven? And Jesus says, sell everything and give your money to the poor and follow me. The parable of the talents is not a parable trying to convince us that we need to double whatever God has given us for the glory of God, or else our talent will be taken away from us. That's fear and abuse, not love. But if we look at this series of parables about a delayed bridegroom and master who's been away for a long time, and realize that this is part of a series of teachings to a community that was concerned that Jesus had not yet come back to make things right again. They needed some encouragement to keep the faith, to keep loving people, to not become part of the system like the first and second servants to not fall into the trap of legalism like the Pharisees, but instead to graciously reach out and love other people as, as themselves and to be justice-making, love-spreading, difference-makers. When we put ourselves in the place of the people hearing it at that time, 50 years after Jesus, then we're able to see it more clearly today and how it might also be giving us encouragement today. We know this feeling of delay, in the midst of the pandemic and racial oppression and social division and so much more, it really does look like the bridegroom is delayed and that the master is a long way away. And it's easy to feel like the kingdom is impossibly far off. And yet the patient wisdom of Jesus, who says at the end of the gospel of Matthew, 
And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We realize that Jesus has been with us all along and that it, even if it seems like he's been delayed. Because we see Jesus every time we feed a hungry person. We see Jesus every time we welcome a stranger. Jesus instructed us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew to make disciples of all nations and to teach them to obey everything that I commanded you. His commandment was to love each other. In this time of pandemic, while we are waiting, we are to love people, to call for economic justice. The stock market is at an all-time high, and yet 50 million Americans are experiencing food insecurity. This parable of the bags of gold reminds us that we are accountable for how we love each other while we await the return of Jesus. It's not about doubling our money for the glory of God. Instead, we are called to the life of a servant. Bishop Curry said recently, if you want to follow Jesus, you must become servant of all. What kind of servant are we? Are we servants like the first and the second, doubling our money for the master? Or are we a servant willing to love our neighbor as ourselves, willing to love our enemies, willing to seek justice for everyone, willing to be cast out in the darkness for the sake of Jesus. Lord, help us be the servant that you call us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.